The sacred silence is that sustained, no thoughts in your head, fully present. Now, the piece that's missing in our culture is that we don't train our children to be completely aware. We don't need to. We've killed off all the apex predators. Look both ways before you cross the street. That's pretty much the extent of our training as kids. And if you think about the institutionalization of our mind, when we go into um, a school setting, it's more about command and control issues and responding to external stimulus than it is about being proactive and wanting to plug into your environment. So what happens between that wide-eyed four-year-old who just wants to soak up all of the adventure, jump off the furniture with a cape and a broom as a sword, and the sixth grader? Um, so I want you to picture childlike curiosity as a starting point from which this antenna array is actively exercised and cultivated into deeper and deeper levels of awareness to the point where that little voice in your head that talks to you that says probably right now, I don't have a little voice inside my head, what's he talking about? That thing that reads to you at night, that is overwhelmed because so much information is coming in that the reticular activating system at the, at the base of your skull that filters out everything that it deems is not necessary for your success or survival is wide open. And it's done in the context of a healthy, natural landscape. So we're not in a flight or fight response. Thus, the native idea of survival is when you have a place to be and a time to get there. That's also the definition of being lost. Any suffering outside of that context is a commentary on your skill sets or your lack of connection to the landscape. So that's, that's it from a native contextual approach. Now, when we back up, you know, it sounds kind of cosmic cowish, doesn't it? Lose your mind, you come to your senses. Your senses are feeding you information faster than your, the, the higher level uh, thinking voice can process. It comes to us sometimes in intuition, gut feeling, sixth sense, uh, lucky guess, I had a hunch, right? <clears throat> Women's intuition is a, a, a common but it's not just gender specific. Those feelings that that person isn't going to stop when, I, when that light turns red come from experience, come from really subconscious input coming in from cues that you may not believe that you've noticed, but on some level you heard the acceleration of their engine amongst the din of the cab of your car as people are talking and the radio going on and all else. But as the driver, your awareness was outside enough to know on some level, I better slow down. And maybe this has happened to you before where something drops off the counter and you catch it before it falls. Your brain didn't go, hmm, the trajectory of that object should meet you. No, you're not having algebraic formulations going on and then a decision, I should catch that. By the time you come to a decision, it's already on the floor. It happens too quick, right? The sacred silence is, brings you to that place of presence. To be fully present with everything in the environment and what it's telling you on a gut level. You don't need to be a field meteorologist to sense that a storm is coming. The next one is wide angle vision. Actually, before we move on to the next one, these next two to seven are designed to bring you to the sacred silence. So instead of sitting in a lotus position and drooling all over yourself in someone else's pajamas, you're moving through the landscape barefoot or with your senses open if you're not conditioned to walk correctly on the real world. And the information coming in is your dynamic form of meditation. It brings you into what's called the alpha state. That is not the beta state. The beta state is the flight or fight response. The beta state is, uh, some of its indicators are thoughts in your head and moving from point A to point B. It's funny, we got rid of all the predators that put us in that flight or fight response and then we strap onto our wrist and it chases us every day. Mm -hmm. And so now the new baseline over the last 500 years has been... Can't believe what I did last Saturday night at Bill's party. Dude, three keggers this Saturday. Thank God it's Friday. Hump day. It's so ingrained. It's the new baseline. It's not normal. Certainly not for our species unless we are in combat. 
or hunting or being hunted, which is how much percentage of your daily life? Less than 20, hopefully. Because <laughs> if it's sustained longer than that, it's unhealthy. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, wide angle vision has nothing to do with your eyes. And we can do an experiment right in here before we go outside and do all this. Look at, uh, I don't know, this is bright. Actually, that pink chalk is bright. And this, this will be good. Look at one of these two pieces of chalk. Don't look at anything else but those pieces of chalk. You're funneling in on a target. This is how we're trained to use our eyes. When we were born, we didn't do that. Now, I want you to keep this in the center of your gaze, but open up your field of vision to encompass the entire room. How many of you can see the insects that are kind of flying around, or my hand moving, without moving your eyes? You can still see the chalk, but you can see my hands moving, right? Are we all on board with that? Mm -hmm. Right? His foot moving, you're adjusting your hands, this fly going out over here, um, and this fly coming back, same fly going up and around, scratching, right? All of that at the same time. With limited or limitless field of focus, and you're using the rod and cone cells simultaneously in your eye. So you're improving your night vision, your ability to detect motion. Do it again. Find that same, and now go out. What you can't do right away, most people, is read. And that's because you're using a different part of your brain, a larger part of your brain, the part of your brain that is accessing different parts of your physical awareness abilities, tactile, olfactory, audio, and the synergy between all of them, by the way. And so when you start doing that, those intuitive hits start coming. I feel like I'm being watched. And you turn and you look and you're making direct eye contact with a cat, a bird, a person. Anyone ever have an experience like this before? It's only when we slow our biorhythm, our, our heart rate, our breathing to a place where a lot of our folks in our communities consider, you know, this is what gurus do. Um, it's also what every four-year-old is doing. Right? Um, that we can allow things to come in that aren't in our filing cabinet of predetermined reality. Turn off the alarm clock a second before it goes off, step over the pile of laundry at the foot of the bed, brush my fangs. You go through this routine and there's certain expectations and you're looking for the coffee pot, the car keys, the car, the route to work, the landmarks on the way to work, right? The radio station. You got it down. But it becomes a rut, right? So when we slow down and we start going into wide-angle vision, wide-angle vision has nothing to do with the mechanics of your eyeballs. It has everything to do with how you start to process that information coming into your brain. And the next piece is fox walking. We're going to go out there and do that in a bit. But basically, we're going to take the way that we move ourselves mechanically across this artificially flattened landscape and reintroduce our body to the way it was supposed to move. Not using our calves and our groins, but our big guns, our butts and thighs. Not moving from this overrated wrecking ball when we first learned how to walk, right? But from our center, like a martial artist or a ballerina or anyone who's kinesthetically astute. They move from their center. Now couple that with total sensory awareness. What do I mean by that? You're going you're gonna to be able to, to tr take your body for a test drive by turning all of your awarenesses on. We're going to do that in a few moments here. Getting your senses out of the hospital bed. How many of us turn down the volume when the advertisements come on, on television? Or turn the radio station when there's something that we don't want to hear anymore? It's just, oh, that's pissing me off. I don't want to be pissed off. I want to be happy today. We have to go and turn off our antenna array or else the blinding fluorescent lights and shiny linoleum floors and the big box stores are going to overwhelm us. Don't think for an instant you won't pick up some stress after a week in the woods and you come out to the night before Christmas, everything's on sale special at L.L. Bean. It gets a little tense in those environments and you can feel it, right? Some people get in the car and they go, "Tis the season." Avoiding the uh, rut of routine. 
So just like I was giving you the example of getting up in the same fashion every morning and going to work in the same fashion every morning and coming home, that's how the hunter bags the deer. The deer get into a rut of routine and they don't see around them. They just see, here's where I cross the river and there's the apple tree. Mm. And that's where I put my stand. Because <laughs> they're focused on crossing the river and getting to apples. They're not focusing on some 220 pound guy dressed like a giant pickle with a bow in his hand. And I'm going to have a freezer full of meat. Because I've read that rut of routine. Change your routines. If you can't because you're on public transportation, change the way you perceive. Role play. It's fun and no one needs to know. You're the undercover detective. You're the mom looking for the lost child. You're the lost child looking for the way home. You're the advertising agent and just viewing what's on the walls of your competition. How can you do this better? You're the martial artist. You're invisible. How would you position yourself in a crowded subway car without being seen? Or noticed or remembered? It's a playground out there. And if it's not, you're living a euphemism for a living dead. <clears throat> you're just kind of cocooning along. Turn you into one of these, you know? Right? Vague movie reference. My apologies. Focused hearing. <laughs> Focused hearing, or focal points in dead spaces. So if you're avoiding the rest of the routine, this will take care of itself. One of the games I play with my kids, or used to, now they're getting me with it, is <clears throat> Grandma and Grandpa only live four miles down the road. And it's a pretty straight shot with two right turns. So when they get mad at me about going the same, the different way each time, which I normally do out of habit, we'll go the same way. But this time you have to tell me, as we pass each house, how many people live there and why. Or this time you have to tell me, where are the oldest trees? Or this time you have to tell me, how would you sneak through this woods to get to Grammys without crossing any backyards? Or this time you have to tell me, who has dogs, who doesn't? Where is the nearest drinking water source in this neighborhood? Where would the highest concentration of mosquitoes be? Each time you're looking for something different. It's not the same tired landmarks. Any of you, anyone here ever get lost? You ever get lost taking a shortcut and it doesn't turn out the way you want it to and you're kind of like, oh crap, where am I? <clears throat> right? And then you see that familiar landmark and it's like taking a mental dump. It's like, ah, I know where I am. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You slid back into that rut. When you were lost, you were awake. Alright, where am I? Crap, I don't want to be late. There's like adrenaline, there's a motive, a motive investment. That's key if you want to get good at something. Invest yourself emotionally. You should love what you do. You could learn the other way too, but it kind of sucks. <laughs> I never want to do that again. I'm on car 50 something, and this time I need it. It's my last car. It's going to last forever. I'll never do that again. <sighs> Drive from Boston to Maine with no serpentine belt. I'll never do that again. <laughs> never check the oil. I'll never do that again. All right? I'm running out of ways to break cars, so this has got to be the last one. I just. <laughs> Just kicked food in the nuts out of that one. Guarantee you something's going to happen. I've never had happen before. You put it in the wind. Yeah. Transmission trouble this time. Right, I'll never do that again. Thankfulness. We'll, we'll do focus here because that's a technique. Uh, thankfulness is the, if this were a sandwich, these two pieces are the most important ingredients. Sacred silence and thankfulness. It might sound a little weird, but once you start opening up your awareness and then you immerse yourself in the world that we all share involving Walmart and McDonald's and traffic jams and toll booths and taxes, when you get back into that world and your awareness suite is opened up, it sucks. It feels horrible. And there's people who are angry and they stay angry. Nature's great. Humanity sucks. It's the same world. Find things to be thankful for. You know, it's, it's what prisoners of war did in World War II to survive. And in Vietnam. It's where people were in prolonged hurt locker situations, more often than not, finding thankfulness, a reason to keep going, is what separates the living from the dead. So... I used to think being tough was strong. When you're young, you and you're 20, being tough is strong. But now I find myself saying, don't take my kindness for weakness. 
Being tough isn't strong. Being tough is, I want to be strong. Being kind and being open with your awareness when the, when the crap is hitting the fan, that takes a degree of strength that few people know. When there's crap going on, like broken bodies and cars and people screaming, yeah, you want to go in. That traumatizes the shit out of you. But if you're compassionate and you make a connection, even if it's their last breath, you make that connection, you sent them out in good form, that's what you hang on to to get through those dark nights. You've got to find the thankfulness in things or you'll go mad when it starts to get real.